I'm going to be floating this hands-on thing to see how this works. So I'm going to run through some, some basic background on antenna stuff. Uh, if, uh, there's no theory. It's just metrics on what do all these numbers mean. And then anybody who's interested is going to be able to come up and play with my vector, with my vector return, return loss here, the, the vector of reflectometer, and see how do these environmental things impact the performance of actual sample antennas. So metrics, gain and radiation pattern. So we got that nifty picture there for the radiation pattern. Um, it's literally the energy level. Um, if you have an antenna and that antenna puts the energy that you're transmitting into it or the focus of its, of its receiving capability in a direction that's not useful for your application, well, that's bad. <laughs> you, want, you, want, you want it to, lo to look in the right direction. Sometimes you can control that, sometimes you can't. Um, efficiency uh, is just that, power in versus power out. Um, the efficiency number is, is typically referenced in percent. Um, that is kind of, a, that's, a, that's a nod to the fact that most of us uh, in the antenna business are selling, to, selling antennas to people who are not other antenna engineers. We do everything in dB, so um, when we think of how good is this antenna, we say, well, the average gain is minus 3 dB. Well, that's not real helpful for most people. It's much, much better to say, well, yeah, the, the efficiency of this antenna is, is 50%. Oh, I, I get a feel for what that means. And um, the only downside of that one is uh, it's, it's, not, it's not like your test grades in college. It's, it's different. It's a lot different. So 50% is a fantastic antenna. Anything better than 50% is good enough to stop working on because you're not making it significantly better. 25% um, still pretty good antenna. That's, that's okay. It's not great, but you know, it's good enough for most things. 12.5% is, a, uh, uh, is a not a very good antenna. Uh, and anything under 12 is a piece of wire. Uh, just pretty much not an antenna. Um, Bandwidth. So the frequency range over which the antenna is effective and efficient, that really comes back to what you'll see in this return loss measurement, uh, which I'll discuss here in a minute. But it really boils down to what, what bands can I use this for? What, what radios can I use this for? Um, and a lot of times, it's not exactly obvious that you can use a particular antenna for other bands. Um, we sell a lot of, uh, of cellular antennas to people who are doing 915 megahertz ISM band solutions because our cellular antennas are really, really good. And it's not really in our best interest to go have a whole separate set of products that work at 915 only so because they overlap. Uh, ECC, envelope correlation coefficient. This basically comes down to how different are, are, are the, the signals seen by two antennas in a MIMO system or a diversity system. So if you've got to do diversity or you've got to do MIMO, if, those, if, you, if you were to superimpose those two antennas right, next to, right on top of each other, which of course you can't because you know, they'd hit each other, um, they would both receive exactly the same signal. Uh, the envelope cor correlation coefficient there would be one. They're, they see exactly the same thing. Um, if you do things to affect that, uh, and there's a bunch of tricks, uh, changing radiation pattern, uh, um, changing uh, polarization, um, and then physically cr increasing the space between the antennas, um, that'll, that'll create a situation where you'll get better and better envelope correlation coefficient, which for a MIMO solution means you're going to get better and better separation of the, st of the spatial streams i.e. bandwidth. So better ECC, faster data throughput, faster actual data throughput for your real thing when it's really implemented. Um, uh, for a diversity solution, um, doesn't there's, only one there's only one data stream, so it doesn't increase your speed, but it does increase your effective receive sensitivity because what, what one antenna may miss because it couldn't quite hear the transmitter. The other antenna can, and those things are combined for diversity.
antenna metrics. So those last antenna metrics, those are all radiated metrics that are done in a chamber. You need a fancy box. Uh, and lots of them. And it's really quite large and kind of expensive. These metrics are conducted. Now, we're going to basically be messing with the first one here in the little hands-on demo. Um, and return loss is, of the energy that I put into the, to the antenna, how much is reflected back out of the antenna, back at me. Whatever energy is reflected back at me is wasted, right? It's, it's going nowhere useful. Um, however, just because there's a certain amount of energy going into the antenna doesn't mean that it's being radiated in a useful way. Um, it could be wasted as heat, um, or it could be radiated in a direction that isn't helpful to you. And that's where the whole radiation pattern thing kind of comes in. Uh, I like uh, 7 dB, 7 dB return loss. Oh, return loss and visoir are the same thing. They're, they're exactly the same measurement. Return loss is in dB. Visoir is a straight ratio. It's just whether you have the, the log calculation on it. So um, we antenna engineers, we really like our dB. So that's why we always do that. So. Um, and uh, yeah, 7 dB return loss uh, is 80% in, 20% reflected. It's about a 2.5 to 1 return, uh, uh, visoir ratio. Um, and it's that whole 80% seems like good enough, right? It's a, it's a, it is truly an engineering judgment call. Um, so some people will say even as low as 5 or 6 dB return loss. Um, is good enough, and especially for very wideband antennas, that's probably the best you're going to get, especially if it's a physically small product. Um, uh, some, some RF engineers who with little experience uh, dealing with antennas will specify they want a 10 dB or 15 dB return loss, and uh, that is not necessary. It does not buy you any measurable increase in performance. Uh, environmental effects. So, and I apologize for this particular slide, because this was supposed to have some cool graphics and stuff, and I totally ran out of time. But uh, really what it came down to here is, so radiation pattern blocking. So if you have a, 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 a typical tractor trailer unit with a semi, semi tractor and a, a trailer behind it, that trailer behind it, that trailer sticks up about three, four feet cab on that on, on that, that combination unit. If you have your radio antenna on the roof of the cab, then the radiation pattern is blocked by the, the trailer. So there's no effective, useful radiation going backwards because there's a big metal trailer there. So that exact same thing holds true with small embedded antennas. Um, I, I regularly see customers um, who not not having any background in antennas and not knowing any better, go and put an antenna in a situation where, uh, for instance, if it's above another PCB that is entirely a ground plane, blocking all of the radiation in that direction. Um, the performance criteria of efficiency, efficiency is radiated energy in a sphere. And if you block one half of that sphere, you immediately remove half of the radiation efficiency. So if you were 50% to start out, you're at 25%. Um, and for those of you familiar with the, with the, the, the cellular, uh, uh, cellular measurement criteria, that literally turns into a 3 dB hit to your TRP and your TIS. And especially with LTE, you don't have 3 dB to give away. <laughs> so uh, radiation pattern blocking is probably the, one of the biggest single issues that we see in implementations for internal antennas. Um, surface reflection loss. One could easily argue, well, I have this antenna above a ground plane and I'm radiating towards that ground plane. Surely that energy bounces off the ground plane and goes somewhere useful. Mm, well, kind of does, except there's typically 6 to 10 dB of, of reflection loss off even a good reflector that has any, any surface coating of any sort to it, such as printed circuit boards with, with, uh, with solder mask on them, and wires and components and all that other fun stuff. 
So effectively, nope, that, that energy just goes away. Um, those are things that are impacted, that, that show up with your design when you, when you put your mechanical solution together. Detuning, detuning happens not only in that situation where, you, where you're designing and putting the whole thing together. Detuning also happens later on when someone picks up their phone, right? Picks up your, your device and they're playing with it or doing whatever they're going to do with it. Um, and there's things you can do about that. Uh, most of them are kind of sophisticated and quite expensive. Um, and then the main one is make a really wideband antenna. So everything, uh, everything that comes near an antenna solution, uh, an, an antenna is going to detune it to a certain extent. It's going to pull it off frequency. Typically it pulls it down. Uh, it's, it's, it's capacitive coupling and loading, we call it, load, field loading when you put your hand near it or you put uh, uh, other materials near it. it. The behavior is different depending on whether it's, whether it's a dielectric material uh, and the conductivity of the material and all those sorts of things. So plastic behaves, behaves different than metal, which behaves different than meat. And so uh, that's one of those things where if you're building a product that is just going to get strapped into the, body, into the dashboard of a car or bolted to the roof of something, that's a nice, that's a nice straightforward situation. Um, when you're trying to do wearables, trying to do something that, that uh, people are going to be interacting with with their hands, that dramatically complicates factors. Um, um, the expensive, sophisticated things are, that you can do about that basically are active antenna tuning. You're, you're building an active control loop antenna tuner that's tuning the thing in real time. Um, uh, you pretty much only run into that in handsets at this point, um, so far anyway. Uh, finally, near-field coupling. Um, near-field coupling uh, is a phenomenon where you have um, a radiating element and another conductive element in the near field, uh, so within like one or two wavelengths, basically, of that main radiating element. And what you see is that the presence of that other conductive material uh, dramatically uh, decreases the performance of your main antenna, even though it doesn't necessarily detune the antenna. Um, it can detune the antenna, or sometimes it doesn't. But it does dramatically in, in impact uh, efficiency. So what I've got going there is uh, I put some markers at frequencies that people playing with cellular or Wi-Fi things might care about. and. Um, what it's showing is the return loss. And the idea is that anywhere, that, anywhere where that return loss is, is, uh, is better than 7 dB, that's good. Well, you notice that 787 is at 3.8 uh, 3, 3 for return loss there. This, is a, this antenna is designed specifically to, to work on a metal surface. It was designed to go on shipping containers. Um, and because of that, it really vastly prefers to be mounted on a metal plate. Take it off the metal plate, change the orientation of the metal plate, the whole performance changes completely. This is a good illustration of as long as you can control how the antenna is implemented in your application, you'll get consistent performance. As you can see, it's not moving around. I mean, it, it's jiggling a little bit, but that's because of the, the measurement. But, uh, but as soon as you change, uh, change the details of how the antenna interacts with its surroundings, everything changes. This is why when we talk about antenna implementation at Tau Glass, we're very specific. If you're going to use one of our internal antennas in particular, this, this usually isn't a problem with externals. It's a huge problem with internals. If you're going to use one of our internal antennas, you have to use it exactly the way it shows up in the, in the data sheet and on the eval board. And if you do anything other than that, all bets are off. And that's why we're here to help you. Because uh, unless you have an antenna back and the tools to go do antenna measurements, including the, uh, a reflectometer or a vector network analyzer and the anechoic chamber, 
you won't have the tools to be able to go ensure that your, your antenna actually works right. And for cellular, that's, that's, where, uh, that's where bad things happen. <laughs> bad things that involve having to go back and do your entire mechanicals over. Because uh, typically, that's a situation that, is, that you run into with, with internals. Uh, you're, you, you, you didn't know it when you, when you built the assembly, when you, did, when you got the mold made for the mechanicals, but you were already doomed. <laughs> and you won't find that out until the end, and that's, that's, no, that's no good at all. That's, again, that's something else we can help with in terms of helping the customers prove out uh, basic mechanical concepts of what antenna should I use, where should I use it, how good is good enough, things like that.